Uh, like I said, I'm Maggie. I'm going to set my large box down here. That'll come into play later. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. Like Tito said, we partner on many, many things. Uh, before my time with Lighthouse, I was a refugee foster parent, and uh, those were unaccompanied minors that came to the border. Um, all of them that were in our home spoke Spanish, and we had a phrase that we used a lot, and it's, somos un gran equipo. We're a big <laughs> team. Um, so I think that applies to our community together. We couldn't do this work alone. Uh, you have your citizenship classes that we partner on. You've loved on our Afghans. You've loved on newer asylum arrivals. Um, so part of me coming here is just saying thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I spoke with Lil and Phil, and they said, we love Lighthouse, and I said, we love Intersection Ministries. <laughs> so thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk through this. Um, uh, if you want to jump to the next one, there we go. Okay, so for those of you that don't know Lighthouse, um, we are a nonprofit immigration provider. We're on the south side of Holland, right behind Holland High School. And these are our services. So renewal clinic, that can be work permits, uh, residency, like a green card, DACA. You actually have to renew DACA every single two years. It's like your license tags, but it depends on how stable you are with your status. Uh, we also do general consultations. So if you don't know what kind of immigration remedy you have, we help figure that out. If there is a remedy, um, we can do adjustments of status. Um, maybe you married a U.S. citizen and you want to adjust to get your green card. We do a lot of family petitions, really reuniting family members. Um, waivers and FOIA, that's usually we have to ask permission from the government because maybe we stayed over our travel visa or we were unlawfully present for a while and we say, listen, I need to ask forgiveness um, so that I can pursue a more stable remedy here. And FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, a lot of people don't know what they've filed for. They don't know what's on their record. We do a lot of those. And then the, the heartsy one is a, a big piece, humanitarian. Um, up until a couple years ago, we would do things like T visas for trafficking victims, U visas for victims of violent crime. Um, if you are a domestic violence victim, you can actually apply for VAWA, which gives you residency for reporting on those crimes. And then a tiny, tiny bit of that was asylum. We only had like a handful of cases for the first few years that we were around. And then if you can go to my next slide, does anyone have this sign in their yard? I do. I've had to replace the metal prongs because it's still going, <laughs> but otherwise the sign is good. I'm going to take you back to 2021. And uh, this was a really big year for us. This sign is part of our welcoming initiative. And I hope you like my stick figures. That was the best way to represent <laughs> us. 2021, we only had seven staff members. And if you see the little bars, those are the number of cases that we did per month. So we didn't even make it to 50 cases per month, and we were busy. Then August rolls around, and the country of Afghanistan falls to the Taliban. And in the US, nearly 90,000 Afghans were resettled in the United States across the nation. 90,000. That's a lot. People leaving their homes, their cultures, their country, their language, their food, their safety. Here in West Michigan, we had over 300 Afghans coming. And um, part of Afghans were, were labeled by the UN, saying, OK, you've got a refugee status. And because the US had a lot of involvement in that, they also gave them a special thing called Operation Allies Welcome, an OAW stamp that said, we're going to support you. We're going to find places for you in the US. But once they set foot in the US, they got housing and benefit supports, but they didn't have anyone providing legal services. Just because you're a refugee and you set foot in the US doesn't mean that you have a stable status. So no one was around to provide those legal services until Lighthouse said, I don't know, let's give it a try. <laughs> so we gave it a try. So if you do the next slide, 2021 was kind of our tote bag of the typical cases I explained. Let's go to the next one. 2022, we got up to 10 people, which was amazing, and a huge contribution by Intersection Ministries and a group of churches. Um, see that giant line that's almost up to 200 in May? 
That's when we started processing 291 Afghan asylum cases. That's a lot. I want to show you my box here. I know it's Christmas time. Everyone's looking for a really good box. Um, <laughs> this one I'm going to keep, though. Um, it's like your typical office box, right? These became a hot commodity in 2022. <laughs> we would use all the paper, of course, and then we would open it up, and we would fill it to the brim with asylum applications. And there were these neat little tidy manila envelopes filled with people's stories and traumas and reasons why they had to flee, the fear, the danger, the risk. And we loaded them up, and we taped them up a lot, and we labeled them with OAW so they knew they were extra special, and we sent them off to the government. I lost count how many boxes we filled with, a with asylum applications. Box after box after box. The Postal Service loved us at that time. <laughs> and we shipped them off. So that was a big part for you. We had an asylum attorney that we could hire and work on these cases. We had a, a troop of interns that helped. So 2022, we have 10 people. We've got our tote bag of normal cases still happening. And then we have box after box after box of Afghan asylum applications that we're sending out. Well, the church partners also said, yes, we want to support asylum for our Afghans, but what about everyone else? What about Nicaraguans, Hondurans, Guatemalans, Cubans, Haitians? A lot of times those are the people setting foot in the U.S. with no special refugee status, no OAW stamp, no federal funding, no resettlement agencies, no help with housing and food and work permits and community and a caseworker that you can call and say, I don't know what to do. None of that support. So I'm sure the intersection had people say, what do I do? I need help. That's what y'all do. That's what we do. We help our neighbors. So if we go to 2023, you'll notice there are still 10 stick figures there. We still have 10 of us. And you'll notice the blue lines for 2023, we got close to 300 cases in July alone. This year, 2023, we did 50% more cases than we did in 2022. The same number of people. In 2022, we did 50% more cases than we did in 2021. So we keep growing a lot. Uh, but 2023, we had committed to serve 40 asylum applications. And they weren't neat and tidy that could go right in this box with a shared story of same country, similar trials. They were very different stories, much like these stacks of paper. They were not tidy. They didn't come with a magical refugee status. These are cases that we have to prove beyond a doubt that these people deserve asylum, which is gross, in my opinion. <laughs> And that setting foot in the U.S. is a lot more complicated without that special status. So 2023, we had our regular tote bag of cases. These boxes were finally getting approvals on, which is fantastic. The best calls that we can make when we say your asylum is approved. It's huge. Once it's approved for our Afghans, that means they can finally petition for their spouses and their children still stuck in Afghanistan. One box, a few boxes, turns into thousands of family applications. That also means that they can apply for their green card for more stability. So these boxes are blossoming into more cases. And then our not-so-tidy asylum cases, next year is our year of hearings. We actually have to go to court to prove that these asylum seekers should get approved for asylum. And that's going to be what our year looks like. So... Like I said, somos un gran equipo. We're a big team. We're going to work together. Uh, it's a big year. Um, but I want to talk about what 2024 looks like. Because in 2023, remember how we said we'd do 40 asylum cases? As of Friday, we've done 100 asylum <laughs> cases. 100. It's incredible. Big, messy ones that are everyone's lives and stories. So we're going to be busy the next year, and the calls don't stop. There's still people setting foot that aren't stable and need help. So way back in this time, we had a big pivot era where we said, I don't know, let's, let's try. 
So in 2024, we're going, I don't know, let's try. So we're going to keep up with our tote bag of regular cases. We're going to help the family members from Afghanistan that are still trying to get over here. We're going to go to court hearing after court hearing to ensure people can get granted asylum. And then we're still going to serve the newer arrivals that need help. And we do that in two ways. We've got a phone triage system that we can actually see if they're eligible and gather their information and also connect them to resources like intersection ministries, like other, other groups are helping. And then we also are going to do asylum workshops because we can't do 100 <laughs> asylum cases again. We have to pace ourselves and we have to pivot. So we're going to be doing workshops where we help people apply for asylum, get more of them out there so that it's more efficient and they're getting those, those timely services. So I know it's overwhelming. We get a little overwhelmed in our office. We still have um, a trauma response of save, saving these boxes in case we need them for the future. <laughs> um, but I want to leave you with there are a number of ways that you can do something. I'm an action item person. I need a to-do list. I need to know what's next. So these are the three things that you can do. Number one, like Tito shared, you can keep our lighthouse shining bright. That can be in a number of ways. It helps support us 10 staff members that are still trucking along. It helps keeping our services moving smoothly. Um, it helps with volunteering and different ways like that. Number two, I want you to remember the forgotten refugees, that even though the UN or the US government doesn't give you a special stamp, we have so many refugees seeking refuge in the US and in Michigan. Many of the countries don't give that magical stamp, but they're still refugees. And that's what a lot of our work to come is covering. And number three, pledge your birthday to Lighthouse. We just turned eight years old at the end of November. It was a big deal. Slightly older than my seven-year-old that's here. Yeah. Um, and I, for one, I turned 38 at the end of October, and I did this. I don't need more stuff. If you ask my kids what my favorite thing to do, it's to nap. <laughs> so I, I just want sleep at this era. Um, so I don't need more stuff for my birthday. So I told my friends, if you want to wish me a happy birthday, give it to Lighthouse. It's much better to help someone with citizenship than getting a chocolate bar, <laughs> although I like chocolate. Um, and it's much better to offer that stability of asylum for someone who had to leave their home than what the present will be for me. So. In the back, at the circle white table, um, I have a placard. If you want to donate your birthday to Lighthouse, scan it. We show you how to do it. It's really simple. And then I also have information sheets about Lighthouse that you can take home. They're in English and Spanish. Grab them. It talks about what we do. There are a bunch of QR codes, um, internships, volunteering, donations, all that good stuff. But if you forget all that I say and all the tote bags and stick, fi stick figures, I just want to say again, thank you for being a part of our team. Thank you for uplifting new neighbors, old neighbors, everybody. Intersection has been such a marvelous gift to us, and it's so great to be working with you. So thank you.